What's up, everybody, and welcome to the No BS Real Estate Show, a podcast that gives you an inside look on how to make smart financial decisions while adding value to your life. I'm Matty Miller with ERA Real Estate, alongside my co-host and real estate investor extraordinaire, Ryan Robbins. Whether you're a longtime investor or a first-time buyer, join us as we dig through the everyday bullshit of real estate. Ryan Robbins, how are you, sir? We are we're live. Literally rolling. We are literally rolling. Get we any are. heads up there? Yeah, we're literally rolling right now. Cool. There's no, there's no uh, intro there. There was. I mean, I gave you that idea that we were rolling. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't too much. So, we are live at the Tap Garden V Pizza in Jacksonville, Florida, um, right to, just north of the Julianton Creek Bridge. Um, and on the south end of the Mandarin area, which is where we often do, that's where our office is, and where I live. So um, we're hanging out here. We're trying to avoid the rain. It's a beautiful day outside. It's starting it's, to spit a little bit. It's starting to spit a little bit. So if we have to uh, move this back inside. We will. But uh, talking a little bit today about multiple offer situations. We have been involved in so many of these lately. Um, it's kind of been ridiculous. Yeah, they went um, away for a bit. Feel like you know, it what? did. It, it, well, it disappeared over the winter time. Months, you know, it disappeared over the winter time. Yeah. Over it's over bad. over the slow time, and now it's like every freaking deal you get involved in is multiple offer, especially anything that's like I feel like three fifty or below. That three fifty to two hundred thousand dollar range. Yeah, man, it's just crazy. And I do a lot on the investment side, so that there <clears throat> been getting a ton lately. So a lot of competition. A lot of people actually pricing below what it's truly worth in order to draw up all of that activity. So. Well, so we'll break down both sides of it. We'll break down from a buyer's side and then from the seller's side. Yep. How you know, as, if I were the listing agent on a property, what would we do? And if I was the buyer's agent on a property, how would we go about that as well? So, I've recently been working with a lot of buyers. And we're on our fifth offer, by the way, of uh, the first four we did not get. Fifth offer, we got beat out by three cash deals. Okay, and the other two were uh, we were in FHA financing. Okay. Um, so we got beat out on a conventional deal. Okay. So, and, I, and I've told them that. I said, listen, you know, you, you might have to overpay for something, unfortunately. Um, so we just wrote it off a form this morning, which I think will probably hit. Um, but yeah, just, just some things to know. I guess from the buyer side, we'll approach that first. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest thing when, um, as, as a buyer, if you, if you understand that the market is just, you got to be patient. Um, yeah. I think for people everybody, that, everybody wants it, at least the investors I'm working with, everybody wants a you know, deal of the century. You know, everyone wants the best deal out there. And right now, unfortunately, here in Jacksonville uh, specifically, we're in a seller's market for sure. Oh, so, yeah. because of that, you can't, as a buyer, expect to have. You know, you can right now expect to make thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on a deal like you could. You know, especially if you're trying to sell it for one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars once everything's said and done. Those deals just aren't out there right now. Oh, so, I mean, six years ago, seven years ago. You could oh, buy them left and right day. off the MLS, yeah. All day. Yep. So margins are much thinner. There's a few a few big companies here in town that are working off of uh, market, quantity. And market not, disruptors. Yeah. Is what I might refer to them as. Working off of quantity and not necessarily uh, one margin. So for the smaller guys like myself doing just a few flips a year, really pushes us out of the market. For sure. So um, that's pretty much what we're dealing with there. So if we're looking at comparing one offer to another, whether you're the buyer or the seller, the points, that the touch points are gonna to be all the same that they're gonna look at. Yeah. And I would say, although we don't have a contract, you could probably pull up a contract, maybe that's what you do while we're, we're sitting here chatting. So there's gonna be a few things that are gonna set your offer apart as a buyer that a seller is going to consider, and these are, I guess, would work on either side, because if you're a seller right now, Correct. you should be looking for these things as well. So. Yeah, I, mean, from, I think from the buy side, for me, uh, I think one thing that I make sure that that, that, that my client knows or my customer um, is to make sure that they know what they're up against specifically. Like, hey, this is this is explaining the market to them. While they may say, "Oh, it's a hot market," well, what does that mean? Yeah. A hot market means that listen, there's multiple buyers out there trying to get their hands on real property. It's not that who the market's moving fast. And that's not what. Yes, that is what it means. But it also means there's challenges and obstacles that go with it. Um, and that's one thing I think from an expectations perspective that I have to explain to 
buyers, you have to explain to investors that yeah. you're not the only one out here looking yeah. at this property to try to throw a contract on it. Um, and this may be stressful, excruciating, painful, heartbreaking, all those words. I yeah. mean, I just felt so bad. Um, I had a buyer that I was working with. Um, and we went uh, well over asking price on a property um, and she she's in love with this property and it was probably going to be her forever home and unfortunately this property was very unique and it had almost two acres inside of a subdivision um, in, a very, in, a, in, a, in a very good neighborhood um, and it just so happened to be that we couldn't get the deal done. Right? I don't know whether some, it was a foreclosure so I can't find out any information from the bank or what yeah. offer they selected because I'm always convinced, I don't know this for sure, but on a foreclosure when you submit an application or you submit an offer, I'm not even sure that the listing agent actually sees it. I think yeah, it goes straight, most of the time I'm pretty it goes sure it goes to straight to the asset and manager. Yeah. So and she's asking me, so she's asking me for, well, can you give me some insight? Did I miss out because there was a cash offer? Did I miss out But this? I said, ma'am, I honestly don't know. I said, I understand that when you submit an offer, it pretty much goes straight to the asset manager. The listing agent itself doesn't really have that much to do with it. It's pretty much just an avenue for the bank to get it on the MLS and yep, get it out there. It. So, and I felt bad because I wanted to have an answer for because normally I can find out if it's a cash offer, if it was, did we get beat out bad? Was it just that, you know, whatever the situation was, and I, and I felt bad. And and I think that was setting the expectation, and it, and it kind of happened quick for her. It just kind of came up, and they were like, hey, this is, yeah, this is what we want to do, and. Um, it's one of those things you felt bad, and you want to, you want people to be prepared for it. But no matter how you might, how much you talk about it, prepare for it, still stinks. Still stinks. Yeah. You know, like and that's and she was literally heartbroken, and I was like, I wish I could like, I want to hug you. I don't. I feel bad. Yeah. But like it's part of the business that we deal with. Um, you know, sometimes we have to play, we have to wear many hats. Yeah. You know, we have to be psychologists. We have to be math major. We have to be uh, financial advisor. Yeah. Um, we have to do a lot of different things, and it was one of those things that hey, she was venting, and I, you know, I tried to console her as much as I could. And, hey, maybe we'll find another one. Um, there be Is it going to be exactly? Is it going to be exactly like that? It's kind of like the big, the, you know, plenty of fish in the sea thing, right? Yeah, but there's not many like Tyra Banks. Yeah. Like that's, <laughs> you know, or there's not many like Rebecca Romaine or whatever the situation is. Like, yeah. Um, there is other fish in the sea, but some are uglier than the others. It's the way it goes. So, um, yeah, again, I felt bad for her, and it's just, again, trying to set the expectation is it's tough for people. And, and in a market that we're in right now, and we deal with it every day, it's... We're seeing it more and more. Yeah. So, the short and sweet, obviously, an offer price will distinguish. That's the, the main one. All right, if someone's offering, you know, 200000 someone else is offering 250000 it's pretty easy to say, pretty hey, simple. we're probably going to go with the, the 250000 Pretty simple. Now, we want to dig into, all right, if we've got two offers, and we'll just use 200000 as the example. We've yeah. got two offers at $200,000 on the same house. Two types of financing. Is that where There's, you're going? Well, I'm, I'm going to basically break down, I'm thinking everything that would distinguish one offer from the other. Now, okay. Financing is being one, but the first thing that goes on the contract is your binder deposit. Yep. So it's going to be essentially your earnest money, which is your good faith to go through and purchase that house. So if you know, offer number one is got a thousand dollar binder that they're going to put down within three days and offer number two says, Hey, I'm going to put $10,000 down. Yep. Again, that right there, you're shows which, you who's really serious. Correct. And this goes one, it's, we'll get to the um, inspection periods in a second, but your binder secured with financing contingencies, inspection contingencies. There's a lot of contingencies that can be put in the contract to secure that money. And at the end of the day, that goes towards your down payment when you're buying that. Or if you're paying cash, uh, it goes towards the purchase price. So it's that much off of that initial offer price. So it's not like you're putting this money down and it dissipates into midair. No, yeah, you're, you know, you, once the offer is accepted. We'll get to inspection periods because that's probably the biggest one, obviously, yeah. uh, and financing as well. But so offer prices being even, your first distinguishing factor is going to be again buyer deposit. deposit. How much you put down. Um, and when you put that down, you can do it immediately. You can do it, negotiate anything. Three days is probably pretty standard for, standard our, market, for our market, up, you know, maybe five. Um, Sometimes from, I do five if I have a buyer that's out of state yeah. or something like that, I do five. From there, I think the next point on our contract that you're gonna run into is closing timeline. Closing date, yep. So again, somebody's looking to move. If you've got a 45 day close, 
in a thousand dollar binder versus a ten thousand bind dollar binder and maybe a 30 day close you know pretty simple i'm gonna get out of my house a few weeks earlier i'm gonna get a little bit more money up front well and a lot of times you have especially if you have a, if you're buying a vacant property yeah um which is fairly normal we have a lot of vacant properties yeah. that we show quite a bit um, especially investor st investor situations mm -hmm. or people that have you know moved already 270 you know they're listed at 275 and they got to take off because you got a new job or military as well we yeah. have a lot of that um where they're hey like i guess got transferred i'm selling my house i didn't think i was gonna get transferred again but i did um that sucks so yeah. it's like hey, i gotta sell my house and you know three weeks and all of a sudden hey i'm moving to san diego yeah um boom it's happening so it's vacant it's there it's ready to roll hey sooner the sooner we can get somebody to close on this thing the better off for the seller less insurance i'm paying less, yep, less property taxes, less taxes I'm, paying, I'm paying you know less, less liability overall so that's yep. that makes it more attractive i want to say the next probably hot point would is be the type of beer we're drinking that could be okay what type of beer are you drinking I, I can't even order it right. You expect me to remember it here? <laughs> I'm drinking a Sunrise... Sailfish. Or Sailfish. I have to remember Sunrise this Sunrise by beer. Sailfish. There yeah, you go. Sunrise by Sailfish, by Sailfish, which is a Blondale, I believe. Sure. And I'm having by Sailfish, which I really don't know where Sailfish is from. It's a fairly new brewery up here, at least. I think she said they were from uh, Fort Pierce down south. And, uh, down, okay. down south, I think she said Fort Pierce or... So Florida local. Than. Florida local. Yeah, we drink... We try to keep it local, obviously, since real estate's a very local business, but uh, I had to take a time out and talk about our beers in case of anyone. I had a sour earlier. That was that berry jelly. I tried a little from bit of that. Swamp Head. Not a fan. I don't think it's a true sour, but it just had a had a bite to me. Uh, it kind of, kind of turned me off a little I bit. I picked uh, up a bit of vinegar. I'm a, I love vinegar. I could pretty much drink vinegar out of the bottle. But Really? Yeah, but I don't want it in my beer, man. Ugh. I don't know about I like that. Vinegar, I, I can do apple cider vinegar. vinegar chip? Yeah, but I'm more of a jalapeno guy. I like spice. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't drink spicy beer. I, have I can drink a spicy margarita. I can't, I can drink one. Yeah. Actually, I might be going to Flying Iguana tonight, so maybe we'll, uh, they, have a jalapeno, the jalapeno. they have a jalapeno margarita. That's pretty good. Flying Iguana, one of the best, at least my oh, personal my taco favorites. spots. So. It's one of my favorites. I, I like that better than taco loot in Jacksonville, at least. Yeah. So. I don't know why I took the glasses off. Put them back, back on. on. Now it's business. Yeah, now back it's to business. business. Back to business. So, after uh, after closing date, we, closing date, I'm thinking financing comes next. Tech is that the contingencies? Contract. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So financing, and I and I and I'll break that down. Obviously, you have you have cash. Obviously, you have really four types of financing that we typically deal with. Really, honestly, three um, in our market. We don't yeah. really deal with a lot of USDA stuff. Um, and a lot of that would probably or, or, or be owner financing yeah. or anything like that. I, the, the three main ones, um, obviously, is FHA, which is your mortgage-backed um, government-backed mortgage. Government-backed, excuse me, I almost broke. Um, we I just ate a whole pizza, so I'm struggling here. Um, you have obviously conventional, which is not government-backed, um, and then you have cash. Um, simple rule for you: cash is king. Uh, if somebody comes in with a cash offer. And it's anywhere close to what the conventional financing or the FHA financing is. Typically, that seller will take a cash deal over anything for two reasons. Number one, it probably is going to close sooner. Yeah. Okay, it's probably going to be a cash deal. There's no financing. Hey, we can get this thing closed in eight days. They can get it closed next week if they need to. Okay, then you go to what's the next best type? Uh, next best type is probably conventional. I would say so. Yeah. Um, I mean, for sure. I mean, I, now, I would say if you're so. comparing a conventional and a cash offer, if you're the buyer and you don't have $200,000 worth of cash, how can you make your conventional offer look a little bit better? All the points we're touching on, like a binder deposit, uh, closing timeline. Again, all right, maybe your cash is going to close. Eight days is, is quick. That's most, quick. Most are going to do 15, 20. Yeah, 15 yeah. to 21, somewhere in there. So, hey, if you're at 30 versus 21, but you're putting down, you know, maybe they got to wait next week, but you're putting a better binder down. Maybe you've got less other contingencies in the other, regards to the other side of that is, things. is go higher on your price. Yeah, and that's how you can make you know, your conventional offer look a little bit better. If it's $5,000 more and you got a $5,000 binder, binder deposit, yeah. No, maybe you make your binder deposit yeah. non-refundable. Yeah, you know, to do that you, too. Little things like that make Let's clarify non-refundable. Um, and, and let me get your opinion of it as well. So non-refundable, um, basically, if you don't close on that house, you don't get it back. Correct. Whatsoever. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and 
And I had to explain that to somebody, like, well, what do they mean by non-refundable? I'm like, well, if you close an house, you get it back. It's not like you're just paying them $5,000 for you to accept the offer, and then you have to come up with it. No, 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 no. It's non-refundable, and you can do like a $3,000 non-refundable deposit. I've seen that. Um, I probably should have done that on the foreclosure listing that I just okay. did. Yeah. I probably should have done that, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm gonna adjust the camera here as we're chatting. Are you still on? Just wanna make sure, I think we should be still on, but just well, sure I'll entertain the crowd here with a, with a sip of my beer. There you go. Yeah, no, we're still good. We're still rolling. It's good stuff here. We're at 16 minutes. I think I got three or four minutes before I'll give her a reboot. Yep, we're at 15 minutes here. I can always pause, obviously, if I need to. Yep. Anyway, we should probably edit that out, but we're not fancy. We don't edit shit. We're so not editing anything. We're not editing anything. So whatever is said is said. Um, so back to basically financing, financing yeah. types. Obviously, your non-refundable deposit, which we just got done talking about, that's a good tool to use um, if, as long as you're closing the house. Now, if you pull out for inspections because your inspection is, you know, not good or you're not cool with it. You can't you, come to terms on a repair request. You can't come to terms on a repair request. You're still going to forfeit that binder deposit. Yep. So understand that when you do that, that that is non-refundable means I'm not getting that back unless that I unless I close. End of story. Um, Lastly, um, your FHA financing um, is typically your weakest for a few reasons. Number one, um, not everybody qualifies an FHA, and the reason probably why they're going FHA is because they have some credit that's meh, shaky. Shaky. Yeah. I, not that it's bad. It's just not a. It's not a 750 FICO with two hundred thousand dollars worth of income. Yeah, and there's no issues exactly, at all. Yeah. Uh, um, essentially, your FHA is going to accept almost a uh, hundred points less. Than a Correct. conventional? You can do FHA at 580. Okay. 580. Yeah. So um, you can do FHA at 580, um, and you can do very little down, too. So you can do 3.5% yeah. down on FHA, too. Um, conventional, I think the minimum you can do down right now is 5%. Um, I've, I haven't seen anything lower than 5% on conventional. Not Honestly, recently, at least. Yeah, I want to see they had, a, had 3%. Do they have 3 down? Oh, but again, it's one of those where you credit's got to be to a certain level yeah you well you better have yeah you can do fha three percent down but you better have a 700 700 or something like that um again we need to get a, a mortgage person on here and just yeah. pick their brain uh one day i got a couple couple guys sapienza would be a good guy for yep. me so he's a he'll he'll have a beer and uh give us all the give us all the, deets. the, the rundown yeah yeah so um so those are your three major types of financing and and typically, obviously, said it's it's pretty simple. So it's one, two, three. So it's cash, conventional, FHA. If there were three offers on the table and there was a cash offer at two hundred thousand dollars, there was a conventional offer at two hundred thousand dollars, and there was an FHA offer at two hundred thousand dollars. All of the contingencies being the same. Everything else, everything else being the same. Cash is going to be your top yep. dog. Now, if all of a sudden you had, you'd have something to think about. If I had an FHA offer with. Ten thousand dollar binder and a thirty day close. Yeah, and then I had maybe a the binder was non refundable. Yeah, binder yeah. non refundable, and then all of a sudden I had a I had a conventional offer that was two oh five with a four thousand dollar binder refundable, yeah. but still a strong strong binder. Longer close. In, a, in a forty five day close, yeah. like you start throwing all those together and you just pick and you're like, oh. And that's and, where and my cash offer is one eighty yeah. or one eighty five. And it gets really confusing on like, wait, which way do I go? Because here's the deal, is you, well, I can always go back to that person. Yeah. Not necessarily, you can't always go back to that buyer if one falls through, because that buyer may have already moved on and bought another house. And that's one thing that I think people sometimes have a hard time understanding from the outside is there's times where you can quite literally lose an offer. You could have a better offer as a conventional or an FHA in regards to the price. Maybe you offer 215 and I've offered 200, mm -hmm. but you're FHA and I'm cash. Maybe they accepted my 200 cash versus your 215 because they felt more confident in my 200, and that happens. And people are like, "How? I offered more money." Well, they view the cash as a stronger offer because of the contingencies and everything else. Tied Correct. To yeah, and that, so, and that happens a lot. And you keep um, chatting. I'm just gonna yep. zip the video here. So, and that happens often. And and what you can always cash offer if it's anywhere close. Yeah. I mean, if it's anywhere close, they're going to take it. End of story. So, shifting over, uh, how much time we have left on that? We're good. I just restarted okay. it. So, um, so, I guess if we're going to go... Shifting over to, hey, we have all these offers on the table. As a listing agent, how do we sift through all those and explain it to the seller? Well, um, 
I, I'd say let's finish off. Is this yours, by the way? Yeah, that's me. Okay. It's a little warm. I took it out of the car before I came. Okay. So, um, inspection period. I don't, we've been checking we about it. That yeah. would be, let's that'd be the other thing. So, um, that's going to be one hard point that's a contingency where, again, Oftentimes, at least here, your standard is 10 days for an inspection period. If you want to shorten that way up, on the far to, bar, on the far bar, it's 15. Okay. Yep. So now you can negotiate. You could have a 30-day inspection period if you wanted to. You can have whatever you want in there. Again, typically for us, it's 10 days. So the quicker you make that, that's basically saying, hey, I'm going to act quicker and have less time to do my due diligence on your property. So that kind of pulls a little bit of that risk of uh, buyer backing out for the seller. So just tightening up that time frame, bumming it from 10 to 7 to 5, you know, some people even do no inspection whatsoever. So anything like that is going to make your offer, hey, look, I'm gonna, this is my offer. I'm buying the house as is. So, no a, little, inspection. so a little trick that I like to use sometimes um, as a... <laughs> And as, as, as a buyer's agent, um, I work with more buyers than I probably do sellers um, because of what I do with property management. I pick up buyers. Um, I have a very large friend circle. Yep. Um, so people are like, hey, call Matt, he'll help you out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, and I'm always a say yes kind of guy, <laughs> whatever. Um, you know, I'm always kind of a say yes, hey, I'll help you out, man, as much as I can, um, things, things that. So buyers are probably more what I deal with than sellers. Um, and partly I like to look at houses, so yep. it doesn't bother me one bit to, Go look at 20 houses. I mean, it takes it takes time, yes, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I'd I'd rather do buyers than than pound the phones all day to try to find sellers, in my personal opinion. But uh, that's just the personality difference yeah. in general. So anyway, one of the tricks that I like to use, and I don't want any of my you know the, the listing agents to know this, but I will intentionally probably raise I'll raise my offer price and specifically come back. And try to negotiate the shit out of it. Um, in once it's secured, once it's secured. Um, and and even if they think I'm being ridiculous, the fear of them putting it back on the market, because no agent when they list a property wants to put it back on the market, because that makes their fucking sellers pissed. Yeah. Well, okay. And and the thing is, is in multiple offer situations, I have to do a trial with my clients to try to get them yeah. on that property. I got to be the, I got to get them in there, um, and then I'll try to. And they're like, oh, you want five thousand dollars for a new AC? Yep, not closing without a new AC. Yeah. Sorry, put it back on the market. We'll call their bluff. And now and now you've wasted two weeks off the market. Yeah, and, yeah. And they're you know, and they're mad at me, but I don't really care. It's yeah. not my job. To and make they're going to look to see. All right, five thousand. I'm going to take the five thousand dollar hit here, or we're going to put it back in the market. Next best offer was another, two thousand dollars less. Oh, man, three thousand dollars difference, and maybe they're not going to be. Maybe they yep. moved on to something else. So it's a risk that most people aren't willing so to take. So if you get the higher offer, you can always negotiate it back down in Florida. Yeah. That's not always the case in other states. Um, we have our inspection contingency allows us to really what it allows us to do is have a 10 day almost I call it a buyer's remorse period. I don't want to use it that way at all. That's um, essentially what it boils down to. I tell people all the time. I mean, I personally don't like it because I say to people all the time we're putting it off. I'm like, you could quite literally wake up tomorrow, stub your toe on the side of the bed, be pissed off, and just say, screw it, I'm not buying a house anymore. Oh yeah. You just stub your toe you and, can your, do all and your mat. Yeah. And guess what? You can back out and get your binder back within that period. Yep. So that's what I don't like about it. A little too lenient you know, on the. It on can the be for sure. I, 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 yeah, and I and I understand why it's there too. Yeah. And it, and it's only ten days, so and you can extend it out, but that's whether the seller wants to accept it or not. Correct. That's their that's their end. Um, but it's being the fact that it's only ten days. It's really not gonna. It's not gonna. You know be an issue to make that seller whole again if it's 10 days like it's a week and three days like yeah. it's not if it was a month you know commercial deals have I mean, a whole, they, be, they yeah. get they got 60 days to get shit right and do all that but yeah on a residential deal you got 10 days do it get it done let's go from there and i don't tell my buyers to use that typically to pull out well i use that more as that's the second set and to quite honestly to me that's the more important negotiations throughout the process. And, and to your point, I lost out on a deal not too long ago, and it was, I found out after the fact that it was uh, another investor in town that I do some work with that had put an offer in. So I obviously ended up finding out what the final numbers were, and our original offers were- I'm smiling because I already know the story, so <laughs> our, <my bad. laughs> our original offers were $1,500 apart. My offer was 1500 $1, that's it, below yep. what his offer was. 
and they're going to close now I had a shorter inspection period uh, but our we were both the you know same offer price same financing same everything down the line and after they did their inspections I had my price was which I didn't I didn't do an as-is. You can do an as-is contract. Mine had an inspection contingency in my mind. Even on even on as-is contracts, you can have an inspection. You can. You can. You can have. A you can still do it. They're but just not going to make you're any gonna, repairs. Yeah. You're either inspecting it to confirm what you didn't know, or Correct. confirm what you did know. I put basically, I had in my mind, hey, look, I'm not going to whatever this is, and I get, didn't relay that. They ended up, they're closing less than what. I offer and my offer would have been that so they would have made more money with my offer than ultimately to your point accepting a higher offer right. and then getting talked down during that repair request period. so the issue in this market is how in the hell do we get creative with buyers yeah on how to get them their homes yeah and that's where quite honestly it's probably one place that I've been lacking is getting really really creative with writing the offer um, and making people just just not I don't want when a buyer, when a buyer's agent or when a seller's agent, a listing agent gets you have the four offers while you're chatting, I think you can find one which one you want. I want to just look at a okay. purchase um, sale real quick. So my point is, is that when a seller's agent looks at the five offers in front of them, I don't want them to just look at the price yeah. on each one of them and make a decision based on that. I want them to look at everything, and and I'm going to have a complaint with what I like to call part-time agents, um, and. I was actually just having a conversation with a dude at the bar, and he's like, "Man, he's like, he's like, is that what?" You, he's like, he asked me, you know, you do real estate, and I actually had a couple buddies in common with him, and I said, "Yeah, man, I used to, I used a buddy of ours that he was kind of part time real estate, and looking back on it, and every question that I asked him, he didn't really have a clear answer, and I just felt like he didn't really fight for us, and and this, that, and the other, and and, and what I would tell people is find a freaking full time agent because yeah. I. Listen, even if somebody was, I have a livelihood to protect, it's what I do for a living, I guarantee you that I'm gonna to go to the ends of the earth to get that shit done for you, versus somebody who's working a full-time job and does this on the side. Yeah. I, I I struggle with that aspect. There's not, there's very few professional certificates that you can have that allow you to be part-time. Correct. I just, that doesn't jive so, with me. So before, and, we, before we go into what can we do to make one, you know, offer stand out from the other? There's one thing that we had missed, and the second you look at it, you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. But essentially, there's closing yeah. costs on each side. Yes. So there's, oftentimes, when you're gonna look at this on a contract, quite literally, you're looking at check boxes. And your average buyer and seller isn't gonna know that a title search costs $125 to $150. They're just gonna say, oh man, I have to pay for a title search. So one of the things you can do again is check the box on the buyer side. Guess what? It's going to cost your buyer an extra 125 to 150 bucks, but it's one less box that the seller thinks that they have to pay for. Correct. Um, same thing. Municipal lien search, a survey. Hey, guess what? Survey's 400 dollars. Now, if you do a survey, a title search, and a municipal lien, now we're saving that saving that seller three boxes on our bucks. average contract here. If you don't include a home warranty, you've yep. got what seven. So we're going to take off almost half of the boxes, and it's going to cost the buyer. 600 700 dollars 600 bucks you know yeah, six seven hundred bucks but it looks like 50 percent of, of a whole contract doesn't matter what the price is psychologically like, yeah, speaking so that's how you can see, play into that a little when bit when i see three check boxes checked versus seven yeah oh they're they're gonna pay for all this stuff lean search 75 dollars yeah it's just lean search check. 75 bucks you yeah. know which is almost worthless most of the time so um, so uh and that's one of my favorite songs by the way the They've actually guys. got some killer jams. Uh, yeah, they, we, we've been having some really good music today, so pretty excited. But yeah, about so it. that's. I mean, even the attorney fee. Most attorney fee. I mean, even a high end here is four fifty. Yeah, maybe you know, maybe so five. Like, you know, hey, look, yeah. you talk to your buyer. Hey, we're, we're going to make your offer that's the same price, look really, really aggressive versus any other offer. It's only going to cost you thousand dollars. You want to do? You it? Know, we can do that. Yep. So, um, and a good agent on the seller side is going to say. You know, well, it's going to be able to distinguish that. But two, you know, hey, look, all right, well, they've taken a thousand dollars worth of cost. If this is a decent price for in line, that just saved you a thousand versus the other offer that is yeah. not. So, um, yeah, I, I was really in my mind when you said it was going over this. I was actually going down 
the list of yeah. what was coming next. So yeah, and that's that would have kinda been kind of next. Yeah, I think right? the only thing after this maybe is inspection. Uh, yeah, an inspection see. contingency. Yes, sir. Yeah, so there would have been inspection. That would have so been last. We skipped over that. But though. that's one of those that it's that's so easy that's to get so pulled in everything yeah. else. Yeah. Exactly. So there wasn't possession, too much else. Um, we don't see it very often, but that's one other thing. Um, possession and personal property. What up those two? Yeah. Ones? Possession, very rarely, in our market at least, I know there's some states that are a little bit different, um, to where they sell the house and they have X amount of days to get out. Um, I know that my my aunt and uncle just sold a property in California. I don't know if it's normal in California, if somebody out there listening. Uh, Dan, if you're out there, you're in California, you bought a house, I don't know if you know a realtor or have a friend of yours that can look, but I know that they sold their house, they closed, and they had 30 days to remove their stuff from the property. Okay. That could be industry standard for all I know. Yeah. You close it, you got 30 days to vacate, you turn the property over, boom, no questions asked. Um, in, in, in Florida, we get into, we're almost probably 98% buyer will be given possession to closing. Yeah. Um, I, in very few situations, you get into a rent back situation, which is essentially the, the seller, the seller becomes the, the tenant, Yeah. essentially, and that gets a little bit wonky. And every um, now and then you can actually do, I, I think we talked about one on, ever, the, on the bullshit ever, episode. Have you ever had to was evict, the, evict the previous seller? No, but that would be a, that would be a nightmare. <laughs> but you can also yeah. do an early move in, where the Correct. buyer moves in early, leases it back from the seller, and then closes in. Both, so almost goes, like they're leasing their own house early. It goes both ways, so, too. So, I, you know, that's, so that's... That breaks down to what I love about the industry, because there is... More than one way so to skin a cat. I many mean, there ways is to get a, deal a done. million different ways to get a good deal done in real estate. And the, so. the issue with uh, the whole rent back situation scares the crap out of me on both sides, just because yeah. they move into the house and all of a sudden, let's uh, for example, um, Ryan's buying a house and he needs to be in the house 15 days before they close, and all of a sudden he moves in and the AC breaks. The AC breaks and the plumbing's not working right. Yeah. Now all of a sudden he's livid. Yeah. Because the house but that he's buying now. We're past our inspection we're past period. Past our inspection <laughs> period. We've already done all our due diligence all of a sudden. And then that is just gonna blow the deal. And he's probably gonna A, more than likely, and I've heard I've heard stories of this happening where he says, Screw my binder, I'm moving my crap out, and I'm not buying this house. Yeah. And typically in that situation, you're at least forty five days into that deal if you're moving in early. Because yeah. typically, at least in our market, you're probably doing that because of a finance contingency got backed up or something Some happened. Other, yeah. um, and it's so many things can happen to where that makes that situation just uh. it, it's, this is like one of those fine like you walk the fence line because as um, an agent representing a seller anytime that comes up it's no, no. we're not letting them move in early no and on the flip side as an agent representing a buyer I'm like I'll go to battle no. for you. Like I'm gonna push for it, you know. Well, I always say I'm not closing, or I'm I'm not closing until we, unless we get possession. Yeah. On well, the buyer I'm, side. I'm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not closing until we get the possession. Just, so I've done it before. Where and I'll go to battle. I'll go to battle. I'll early. ask. Yeah. I mean, the worst they can do is say no. Yeah. And, it, and that's one thing in real estate. Understand that everything is negotiable. And I think people hear that and they're like, not really. And I'm like, no. Like, there's a you lot can. of things that are negotiable. Now. That's More often than not, are they going to say no or fuck off? Yeah, there's a good chance of that. Yeah. Um, but you can always ask. So it doesn't doesn't mean that they're going to say no or doesn't mean that they're going to say yes. It's just a matter of you can always ask. Um, personal property, this, come, this one comes up quite a bit sometimes. Um, especially more in that luxury real estate area where sometimes a good example is billiards tables. That's one thing. Um, large attachments on a house, um, let's say a shed that's movable, um, and sheds typically don't really get lumped in there, but if it's a large permanent building that's permanent, that's one thing. If it's a movable shed, sometimes the buyer will take that, or the seller will take that, excuse me. Um, but I see like pool tables, washer dryers sometimes get thrown in this. Um, what else can I think of? As far as like personal, personal property, property. When, when someone walks in a house and says, hey, I want that house if that stays. Yeah, so um, I've had it the flip side more often than not where somebody's like, so 
The short and sweet of it is you're gonna, anything that's affixed to the property, like a fence, hot tubs, you know, hot tubs, things, yeah, hot something tubs. like that, that's assumed to be with the property. It's not easily taken out. Correct. Oftentimes somebody thinks, hey, I can move a refrigerator. That's if it's, easy to if move it's for fixated a stove. On, fixated on the property, I believe, is the real Correct, yeah. So term. I often see at the other side, I just did one last month where they really wanted the chandelier. That was in the dining room. It was a family piece that had been with them forever. They wanted the chandelier. So that, this is assumed to be sold with the property. The way, the way a to, piece of the property. The way we to had avoid to put that, that is we had to put when a, they're a seller. Yeah, so as a seller. Change the fixture out before you list it. Well, you can do that. You can change that before you sell it. Well, yeah. yeah, in this situation, that wasn't going to be the case. But um, you're going to put it in as a contingency where, hey, look, all the personal property and the chandelier is coming with, you know? You can, so, write, you can write in pretty much anything yeah. inside the house. Um, typically, that's, that's in our situation... I just, I just took a note on it. Is we're going to do an episode of the craziest contingencies <laughs> or things that were negotiated in the okay. house. I'm sure... Craziest negotiations of all time. Or oh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to find out what's, what the craziest thing I want to buy is. that house, but I want you to keep your... I need your cat and your dog. Like, they come with the house. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, mounted or installed speakers, surround sound systems things like that that may be yep. mounted they're not necessarily built in they're mounted more than anything um, water softeners most of our appliances in our market they all stay yeah um, with the property appliances typically don't move um, however sometimes you find houses without fridge does not convey or you've got a microwave that sits on the countertop and is not it's not you know mounted above the stove or whatever. Yeah, and it's and if it's not mounted then you assume that that's not gonna stay correct um, see so that person would have to provide their own microwave it's a countertop microwave system which is or not expensive anymore. on the buyer side if you're negotiating that you're going to check off hey personal property microwave as part of the contract yep so um, the other thing as we're talking about weird contingencies if you negotiate in furniture things like that I actually have a sale at the end of the month where yeah. it's a cash deal but they're leaving a bunch of furniture behind and I said hey look we're not going to put in the contract because it's going to muddy this up a lot. Yeah. Now, the kicker is it's a cash sale, so it would do less to muddy the water. It's more just from a legal standpoint. I'd rather not even have it in a contract. You want to leave it, great. If you don't leave it or you happen to forget about leaving it, then we're not legally bound to anything. But on a financing side, that can way screw up your financing sure. if all of a sudden your contract is for an extra $10,000 because they're leaving $20,000 worth of furniture and that's part of your valuation on the property. The bank's not going to say, "Oh, hey, the couch is worth fifty bucks," and the you know they're not, they're not going to go. They're not going to go and value yeah, yeah. every piece of property inside <laughs> so the, inside the house. That can weigh throw off the appraisal, which can then mess up your the approval financing. on financing. So right. things to keep in mind there. Um, I think that's pretty much all we have on the buyer side as far as negotiating and going through the contract. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I wanted to hit up. Let's let's completely switch gears here and say, okay. Hey, we are the. Well, all of a sudden, we're not. We're, we're the. We're the listing agent now. And what are we looking for? What are you looking for specifically? That. Hey, if I have four offers in front of me on a three hundred thousand dollar house, you know, what's the first thing that you're looking for? And we've kind of already hit on that. Yeah, it's but pretty much all of these points. It's again, it's going to be same thing. It's just looking at it from a different, through a different and lens. The, and the beginning of this, you know, is essentially the, you know, hey, we're in a multiple offer situation. These are all the points we're going to negotiate through those. Mm -hmm. So in a multiple offer situation, everything we just touched on is what I'm going to look for. We're quite literally a good agent is going to, a good we're buyer's gonna agent is going to negotiate to make sure that each of your points seven, are aggressive. Seven different topics of, yeah. you know. I'm not going to be able to pull them off the top of my head that quickly, but yeah, probably around there. Um, binder deposit. So binder, closing timeline. Closing timeline, inspections, um, financing. Uh, yeah. um, any kind of leaving leaving anything on the property. So personal property. Closing closing cost with on either side. That's on either six. side. That's six. And, and the last one was um, we, just, we just pulled it up. So oh the um, what are you saying here? Go back up. Your acceptance date? Uh, no, not your acceptance date. Your uh, what did I say? Personal oh, property possession? and possession. Maybe? Yeah. And possessions. So there's so there's okay. seven real things. We probably only really deal with three or four of those on any given contract. Yeah, typical one, yeah. Um, and oftentimes, again, it's, if you get, guess what? You've been on the market for two months and you get one offer. Take that one. <laughs> take that one. Yeah, not much to choose from there. So the points that you're looking at on the, you know, as a seller's agent. In our agent, market right now, if you put a property on the market and you have one offer in two months, 
you're highly overpriced. You're, you're, you're overpriced, yeah. You're overpriced. That's that's what the market's telling you. Some people, whether they're sellers or buyers, don't want to listen to the market. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I have to explain to them, they say, well, how are you going to sell my house? Well, I'm not going to sell your house. The market's going to sell your house, and your house is going to sell your house. Yeah. I don't determine the price. I said, I, I have a... I go back and forth with that, too, because it's like, I'm going to market your house, but we're in, we're in, it's 2019. Guess what? We're going to put it online. Everybody that's looking at your house online, any avenue that they want to see it, they're going to see it. All right, we're not selling ten million dollar homes where we've got to market to people all over the world where there's a one percent of your buyer pool. Yes, you know it's a two hundred thousand dollar house. It's a three hundred thousand dollar house. Everybody that's buying that house is looking on every major real estate and platform. They're going to see your house everywhere. That's the distinction um, between. Um, so I think our value comes from providing as much value, finding out as much value about your property that we can put out there, displaying it as best as we can, and then making sure it's not only on those platforms, but then pushing it, and that's pushing it through Facebook this is, ads, this is you know, so YouTube simple, ads, it, things like that. I'm just gonna say this, this is so simple, is get quality photos, yeah. get a little drone footage. Then it be, the drone footage doesn't have to be crazy expensive. They want basically a couple pictures of, hey, where's my property located at? And if it's close to the beach, hey, rise up, Hey, we're, I can see that we're eight blocks off the beach, things like that. Um, go out to a property and go, you know what? These will do. Yeah. They won't even pay, at the very minimum, a decent real estate photographer on a normal three bedroom, two bath house is going to cost you 150 bucks. Yeah, 200 bucks. No, our guys, yeah. our guys, I mean, Jason does some of our stuff for 150 bucks if we're just doing base stuff. Now, yeah. if I want 50 photos, whatever, but if I need like, I do professional photos for rental properties as well. And that, I believe, is probably one of my biggest differentiators between a lot of people, because a lot of people don't do it. Yeah. They go out there with their freaking iPhone and grab 10 pictures and, oh, this is good enough. Somebody will call on this. You know who you're gonna attract? Shitty tenants. Yeah. Tenants that don't really care about the property. If you have professional photos on rental property, and not only really good professional photos on sales, okay, on your sale property, or your listings, you're gonna attract more people. And shockingly enough, like I said, there are still people that go with their iPhone. I saw a house the other day. I, I can't believe how many 300, people see. $350,000 property over in, um, where the heck was that? Over like Kernan and Atlantic area. Okay. okay. Very nice neighborhood. Very B class neighborhood. Yeah. Great property. Literally taking with a freaking iPhone. Like the photos are tilted. Like it's like, the one, what the in the, the hell the is going I look, on? I love here? art. Either they use a fisheye lens, where it's like, uh, it's really it looks distorted. like you're, yeah, it yeah, looks really like you're distorted. In, looking out yep. through a bubble, yep. or they, um, they're they quite literally in the mirror. And it's like, I'm gonna take a bathroom shot, but uh, you like see them in the corner of the mirror. I'm like, too. you're listing a $600,000 house, and you're, you're in the photo in the in the mirror. It's fucking ridiculous. It's I, absolutely outrageous. People, but so. people do it, man, it happens. And it's that's one of those things of, uh, that's the part-time agent. Yeah. That's the part-time agent, so. But there's that's, uh, yeah, that's crazy. There's flies everywhere right now. So, so yeah. Anyway. So that's I would say probably the the short and sweet or the the, the long and exaggerated. Um, let's break down a you know comparing one contract to the other. Yeah. So I would say number one is and I understand comparing. Why. If you're going to com again compare one contract to the next as a seller's agent, all prices being the same. And I'm now looking at a cash versus a conventional or an FHA. Um, part of what's going to, you know, if those that, that FHA and that conventional has stronger contingencies, the other thing I want to see, which we haven't touched on, was the lending side is that pre-qualification to show that, hey, look, you've been pre-qualified with a lender. They're, they've looked over your financials. They've looked at your credit. You're good to go. Let's and explain the difference between pre-qualification and pre-approved as well while we're at it. You want me, you want go me ahead. to so, go ahead. Essentially pre-qualified. You're already is, on a roll, so I yeah, think so they, you go. They've looked at your, they've taken a 5,000 foot view of your financial situation, your credit, things like that. A, a pre-approval would essentially be they've started that process. Um, they're actually gathering your uh, pay stubs. They're, they're looking at your bank statements, things like that to verify and not only qualify you but then approve you for that loan up to a certain amount now they're just the house has to qualify at that point um, it's be um, what would be a good comparison uh, 
how you could do a pre-qualification versus a pre-approval. Essentially, oh, a pre you're approved a pre for... A pre-qual letter typically is somebody who, you might just call them over the phone and they may do stated income, stated... Yeah, they can look at all your stuff yeah. pretty quickly and, and tell you. But I'm trying to think of a, an outside perspective of, Honestly, of taking it outside of real estate or outside of financials of what you would say, hey, look, this is what <laughs> pre-approval versus a pre-qualification would look like. Uh, from a credit card perspective, you apply for a credit card, a lot of times you fill out some stuff on oh, the yeah, internet. Oh yeah, that'd be good, yeah. So they would yeah, say, hey look, you're approved up to $20,000 and then you're gonna actually apply. And, and I say, actually, it's only 50. You get, you, get you, know? that, you get that letter in the mail that says, you've been pre-approved for X amount, and then you go out and actually fill out the application for the credit card. Pre-qualified or whatever. And then they give you $4,000 on a credit yeah. line. Yeah. Same situation, okay? So. And, it's, and it's interesting actually how that, that kind of shift is that pre-approval has actually shifted a lot to where it's not fully approved. Like, believe it or not, you still have people that are, well, are they fully approved? Well, well the, no one's typically fully approved. And until, the whole thing is like, I'm never going to have a buyer get pre-approved because that whole process, the, the whole thing is there's timelines too. Pre-qualification, they're gonna look at your credit, they're gonna look at your, again, basic tax returns and financials, but that's good for 90 days. Correct. So like you have a timeline with that and it's the same thing. Like we're not going to jump through all these hoops if we're not ready to make an offer and we're serious about it. So, you know, if that may be like an eighth point of getting pre-approved, but again, if multiple offer situation, there's timelines, you've got to move quickly. You don't have time to get. The other side of that is what, what I was going to say is I, I've had conversations with a couple of different loan, LOs, lately loan officers, um, lately in, and honestly, with the technology gap shrinking um, between being able to get them docs and all that stuff, and when I say documents, I'm talking pay stubs, W-2s, taxes, yeah. all that stuff that you need to get to a lender to get pre-approved, yeah. okay? There's not a huge difference between pre-qualification and pre-approval anymore in today's world. Because I have, I have a gentleman that works for Loan Depot that basically they have a smart loan, and basically they just send them a link and they upload everything that they need to, yeah. boom, 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 boom. And most people today, I know about you or me, I have all my income documents, all my tax information in a Google Drive folder. By the way, nobody hacked my Google Drive. Uh, that's where it's all hot. <laughs> um, so I probably should have said that out loud, but whatever. Thankfully, we don't have that many fans that really hate me. Um, yeah. So, yeah. at least, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, to where I literally could have all the documents to him and have given him everything with within the snap of the finger. Yeah. Um, and he's gonna send me a pre-qual letter, okay? There's not a lot of, he's not pulling that much more work at no. closing than what he's already done. Because he's already pulled my credit, he's already pulled all my docs, I've supplied him with everything that he needs. As long as I'm not an idiot and go out and buy a new car in the middle of my, uh, that's another thing we'll hit on. Um, as yeah, a buyer, another, by the way, once, once you, once you, that's a whole other episode. Once you've actually qualified on a property or you have the property under contract and you're doing your mortgage application, please do not go buy a new car or apply to buy a Ferrari anytime soon. So, how's it going, guys? Very good. Uh, Don't worry. We'll tell you later. <laughs> um, oh, we're good. We're good. Yeah, very G-rated. It's a real estate podcast. You're fine. Yeah. Um, so, anyway... And, and, that, and that's, there's not that much difference in them anymore. They used to be back in the day because the pre-qual letter used to be, hey, I, it's stated income, it's stated how long I've been at my job. They're not doing employment checks, they're not doing credit checks. They were just, hey, how much do you make? How much can you qualify for? Do you know what your credit is? They're not doing all that stuff because now at the click of a button, a loan officer can have your credit, credit report and everything that you've done in the last 10 years in a heartbeat. So, not that much of a difference, but anyway. All right. So well, let's. Uh, we are, I was gonna say, we're, we're up probably, against it here. Yeah. yeah. So let's wrap it up. That's probably probably everything we needed to cover. Yeah. For so sure. if you guys have any questions, you know how to contact us. We actually haven't given the website in a while, but the the the, 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 the I see it's the for me because the, you're not a college football fan. So you know why it's the. No. You ever watch Monday Night Football? No. All right, where they always say the Ohio State University, okay, okay right. or the, the Miami. Uh, See you from the fucking northeast. Come on. The ah, got a Midwestern over no here, northeastern. Bspod.com. The nobspod.com. The nobspod.com. That's or the nobspod.com. Right, so, um, yeah. So appreciate you guys joining us, and uh, we appreciate uh, the the pizza, the pizza and Mayor, the beer, also known the pizza as the tap, gar the tap garden. 
the oh, wings fantastic. are, if you find yourself in this area, there's three locations for V-Pizza. There's one out of Jacksonville Beach, there's one here in Mandarin, and there's one also downtown in San Marco, uh, Hendricks, off of Hendricks Avenue there. So all of them are good. This is my favorite one. This has the most beers on tap. Um, I don't know if you can tell that I like my beer, but either way, I come here often, and uh, it's a great outdoor patio as well. So always having good times out here at V-Pizza. So. Awesome. All right, so we'll start the uh, start the outro. We'll yeah, go for that. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the weekend, guys. Week, week whatever. whatever it is. <laughs> Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, there's a few things I'd like you to do: subscribe, leave a review, and head over to NoBSRealEstatePodcast.com, where you can connect with Matt and I on all of the platforms we're on. Also, if you could do us a favor, leave a message letting us know what you enjoyed about the episode and what you'd like to hear about going forward. Publish this bitch.